Hi everybody, my name is Nia Jetter and this is Justin Croyle and today we're going to be presenting to you functional safety product development for autonomous mobile robots. So who are we? As I mentioned, my name is Nia Jetter. I'm a senior principal technologist at Amazon. Um, I'm also an aerospace engineer. Uh, before I came to Amazon, I spent 20 years in aerospace and defense, and I love autonomy. My primary focus has been spacecraft autonomy uh, before coming here, and I've been fortunate to work on uh, products that matter hugely to the world. I'm very passionate about just autonomy in general, making things function without immediate human direction, and then also helping people. So one of the projects that I've been fortunate to work on um, was GPS, and so I've worked a the suite of 12 GPS satellites. I've worked attitude determination, navigation controls, as well as autonomy for that program. Um, and those are pretty much my specialties, autonomy and guidance navigation controls. I've also had the opportunity to work across the product life cycle. So from concept uh, through operations. And uh, when you're working in space, operations means working missions, which is actually uh, probably the, my favorite part of that job, like one of the coolest parts about working in that area. So I've been at Amazon for a year and five months now. And coming to Amazon, I've had the incredible opportunity to spend the bulk of my time uh, working as chief engineer and safety lead for one of our autonomous mobile robots. And in translating my skills from a safety perspective to Amazon, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to get to meet Justin Croyle, uh, who's been incredible support, uh, incredible resource as I've been making this shift to this space. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin and let him tell you about some of the amazing things that he's done. Thanks, Nia. Like Nia, um, I started my career um, back in the aerospace and the um, defense industry. So started work, my career working on satellites and um, transitioned out of space into missile defense systems for a while. And then ultimately I landed in um, a division that was doing autonomy on heavy military vehicles. Uh, worked in that sector for about 10 years total and then transitioned over to Amazon and um, as I transitioned, I kind of left classic system safety that was exploring hazards related to hydraulics, pneumatics, mechanical, electrical, all these different kinds of hazards. And I really tried to focus on what now is being described as functional safety, which is really the exploration of electrical and electronic um, control measures to mitigate hazards. And uh, when I did that, I uh, joined Amazon Robotics and started working in their mobile robotics space. So anything that, um, moved at the time, I was kind of involved with it, and uh, this started with really structured field robots, robots that operate on a grid. Um, I was able to certify two different models of that robot, different chassis types. In fact, the uh, robot you have on the screen there was my first project at, at AR. And uh, from there, I transitioned over to um, more non-structured fields, so autonomy, um, applications that could then work alongside people, and that's what I'm doing today. I think my um, greatest achievement, or the thing I'm most proud of, is um, the certification of my first robot type, though. Um, it's the one, again, on the screen, because that chassis is now um, operating all over the globe at this point, um, running 24-7. There's over 600,000 of these robots operating safely, and um, if you have a package that's being delivered to your house, more likely than not, um, this robot was involved in getting your package to you. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna start talk by talking about what is functional safety and why does it matter? And this presentation is going to focus heavily on functional safety, but we're gonna talk a little bit about safety in general and then functional safety and why it matters. Then we're gonna talk about standards as a foundation for building your safety system, your functional safety system and your safety system in general. Um, we're also gonna talk about process analysis and design artifacts aligned with uh, designing your safety system. Then we're gonna move into tools. And then finally, we're gonna talk about some key challenges uh, surrounding uh, building autonomous mobile robots. So what is functional safety? And so let's start by talking about safety. So generally, when you build a product, uh, we don't build products just to build products, we build products to achieve a certain customer need. And so if you think of achieving that customer need as performing a certain mission, Safety is fundamentally responsible for making sure that the robot does not cause harm, for making sure that the product does not cause harm in the act of performing that mission. 
And so your safety system, in order to define your safety system, you have to do analysis, you have to derive requirements, um, you design to those requirements, you implement, you test, uh, you verify and validate the requirements. And, um, and then depending on your safety use case, uh, you are possibly going to want to certify that robot through a third party. And so for our robots that we're building that are moving beyond the structured field, we are certifying them uh, through a third party assessor. So let's talk briefly about product safety. So product safety is a larger category of safety that pretty much focuses on um, whether or not the product as you build it and as you implement it is fundamentally safe. And then as a subset of product safety, we talk about functional safety. And so functional safety uh, refers to uh, defining, relying on a proper control system uh, to make sure that your product performs safely. So implementing uh, logic perhaps like surround, like into a control system to make sure um, that you are uh, executing, that you're performing the appropriate responses to make sure that your system is safe. So why does functional safety matter? And so uh, we touched on it very briefly, but let's talk a little bit more about what it means to operate outside of the structured field, to operate in an unstructured environment. So one way to achieve safety, to make um, the process of being able to convince yourself that your product is safe, being able to do the analysis, being able to like, certify even um, that your product is safe, is to put a cage around it, for example. And so if you restrict the access that people have to your product, um, then that's kind of putting it in a structured environment. And so here at Amazon, we are on the forefront of removing that structured field uh, in an industrial setting. So actually building robots that are going to move in free space amongst people, that'll be able to move freely you know, uh, and help the people in some of our operation buildings and in other settings as well. And so like I know like nowadays you see robots, like there's you know, an example of, uh, of Scout you know, in the on the image you know, that you see on the screen. Um, and so just in daily life, you might be starting to see more and more robots that are moving in free space amongst people. And it's important to note that uh, when you structure the environment, you can, it's easier to require that people have a certain skill set uh, to place constraints on the people that can interact with it. Uh, in the photo on the first chart, like I was wearing a Sibbers vest, you know, which was designed by Amazon Robotics, you know, such that I could go in and interact with some of the robots. And so, it's important to note that as you remove that structured field, um, it's harder to constrain the people that the robot will interact with, like especially in an operational environment where we're gonna have our robots moving in free space to help the people. And so it's critical that we apply a certain rigor, like when we're performing the analysis that we need to perform uh, to make sure that we're appropriately identifying uh, what safety needs to be implemented into the vehicle, what safety systems need to be implemented into the vehicle, and then what operational products and other products we might define to help the people understand, um, help the people understand our robot and its purpose and how to interact with it. And so fundamentally, just speaking to the, uh, like the name of the game when it comes to safety is risk. And so a lot of this boils down to identifying, understanding risk, and just figuring out how to mitigate it. And you know, when we're moving into this unstructured environment, we're pretty much uh, increasing the complexity, increasing the risk profile, like our, our safety use case is different than when we're in a structured environment. So as Neil was saying, you know, why is safety important? We're, our, our exposures are going up now, right? Um, she mentioned that we are going and taking robots that would classically be in an industrial environment behind closed doors, and now you're seeing robotic technology deployed everywhere. It could be on your local sidewalk, potentially, or um, even you could be purchasing robotic products now that are introduced to your home. So um, when we stop and think about the way that safety systems in robotics work, we have to also uh, think about these new use cases. So as Nia kind of alluded to, um, there, were, there were traditional approaches to risk mitigation. Um, if you look on the picture on the left side of your screen, you see this robotic arm. It's a big, powerful arm. It's um, designed to pick up and set down packages. And the, the safety system for this robot, you can actually see on the screen, it is that cage, right? And that cage is a mechanical mitigation. It's a means to separate that hazard from the humans. And this traditionally has been a very effective, cost-effective and um, effective at reducing risk measure um, that we've been able to use in industrial environments. But the use cases in robotics are developing and um, new use cases are coming out every day. If you look at the right side of your screen, you see a, 
uh, an autonomous mobile robot. And obviously, you um, can't just put a little cage around that autonomous mobile robot and have it fulfill its, its functions. So um, we need to stop and think about what kind of safety system now can we apply to that. So um, when we think about safety systems, safety systems, their fundamental role is really to perform safe functions or safety functions. And safety functions have three fundamental parts. The first part is sensing. You have to have some ability for your safety system to perceive an unsafe condition um, and bring that in some form into your, your system's knowledge, right? After the sensing element, you have some sort of logical element. This could be a CPU or an FPGA, something like that, that takes that sensor data in and makes a decision about what that data means for you um, or for your system. And so that logical element then can make a decision fundamentally is are we in a safe or unsafe condition? If we're in an unsafe condition, it needs to take some form of action. When um, a safety system takes action, um, it leads to the third part of a, a, a safety function, which is actuation or an output. Um, so if you've got a mobile robot driving around as an example, there will have to be sensors that perceive the world outside of the robot that can sense perhaps an impending collision. Those sensors feed that data to a safety controller, which makes a decision about what to do. And then when the safety controller determines that a collision could be imminent, it sends its output messages to a set of actuators that say could perform a maximum performance braking stop. Those are the three parts of a safety system. And what this fundamentally does um, is kind of the same thing as what the original cage did, right? We have now gone from a mechanical cage and a mechanical separator between the human and the hazard and created a virtual or digital um, separation between the human and the hazard. And um, that's kind of what safety systems do in the modern context. So, great, you know what the safety system's supposed to do, but how do you build one, right? Um, this is where we bring in the concept of safety standards. Um, you know, luckily for us, um, there have been a lot of people that have thought about safety before us, and we can kind of leverage those lessons learned and that guidance in, in the development of our, our safety systems. And standards are kind of broken down into three fundamental types. There's a type A standard, which um, is very, very general, very top level, and um, can be applied essentially anywhere. These standards, um, the example I've got on the screen is IEC 61508. It'll tell you the process um, to create a safety system, that you need to have these certain processes and procedures in general in place. What it won't do is give you pres prescriptive guidance on how to design your safety system, because that's just too broad of a context. And uh, there's oftentimes frustration with that, because um, there's no easy steps to follow in designing your safety system. And this is a, a case where in um, some certain circumstances, you can look at this ambiguity as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to um, define what your system is and how it works um, for yourself. The next type of um, standard is industry specific. It's a type B standard. The example I've got on the board is ISO 13849. And this is a, you know, 13849 is a machinery standard. It's not meant to be applied to dishwashers or, um, you know, a robot that uh, is an electronic but non-moving device, anything like that. This is uh, very specific to machines classically used in industrial environments. So it's going to be more prescriptive. It's going to have prescriptive guidance on um, what uh, system architectures you should follow. What are the reliability um, limits that should be met for a given performance level? And um, how should you fundamentally implement diagnostics, as an example? It'll um, provide that general guidance, but it's not going to tell you, again, exactly how to design your safety system. It's going to give you this general guidance. Um, and it, it offers just enough direction um, for many users to enjoy using a, a Type B standard. But again, the compliance picture can be a little bit more complex there. And that brings us to the Type C standard. Type C standards are written with a specific product type in mind. Um, you could have an autonomous lawnmower standard that is specific to lawnmowers that don't need people to push them, and they have, they have a lot of prescription on how to build one. The example I've got on the screen here is actually um, autonomous vehicle safety standard, ISO 26262. Um, so the, the strength is if you're building an autonomous vehicle, that is exactly what you intend to do. This standard will tell you pretty much exactly how to do it. It's going to tell you what documents to create, what pieces of analysis are required, kind of the content of that analysis so that you can ensure quality. It's going to give you that nice roadmap 
that you can give to a development team and they're going to know what to do and go off and develop. The flip side, though, is that that ambiguity is no longer there, right? Um, this is a very prescriptive standard, and you should conform to the requirements of this standard if you apply this standard uh, to your, your project. Where this can be kind of tricky is if you're creating something that is similar to an autonomous vehicle but really isn't an autonomous vehicle. If you're creating a robot of some sort or um, something that in some ways has aspects that would deal with autonomous vehicles but isn't entirely an autonomous vehicle. If you apply this standard, you're going to um, be restricted to all the pluses and the minuses that are being applied to autonomous vehicles today. So um, the takeaway here is taking a step back and deciding how you define your, in, your product that you're intending to make and you taking a step back and creating a strategy that makes sense for your product in terms of a compliance picture is, is very, very important. It's a case where an ounce of prevention could be a pound of cure. And that's something that um, as you develop early on every safety system or every functional safety engineer, they should really take some time to consider that. Thank you. So now let's talk about a framework uh, for thinking about autonomy, particularly when you have a safety critical use case, but you know, in general, but particularly when you have a safety critical use case. So safety is the top priority, period, full stop. But now I don't build products just to build products. I build products to meet a customer need. And when I'm building an autonomous mobile robot, uh, that robot generally needs to move through space. And so I could build a robot that's fundamentally safe and just doesn't move at all because it's safe because it doesn't move. Um, however, because I need to meet the needs of my customer, because I need to achieve the mission uh, in order to meet my customer's needs, I need to move. And so it's not enough just to say uh, safety is a fundamental constraint, my vehicle must be safe. I choose to layer on top of that an availability requirement. So some sorts of requirements aligned with availability that speak to uh, meeting the needs of the customer in order to provide the customer the best possible service. And so I consider safety as a fundamental constraint, and then I can optimize for availability. Um, and I could analytically build a system that is safe and that meets certain availability requirements. However, especially when we're moving beyond the structured field, it's important that we build products in a way such that uh, people accept them. They move in a way that's acceptable, that is, is uh, familiar uh, to the people that we're trying to help, the people that they're going to be moving around. So, I layer on top of that predictability. And let me give you an example of what I mean. So I, human Nia Jetter, I grew up in an environment, my, the culture was uh, a jaywalking heavy culture. So people jaywalk, people cross the street, you know, um, not necessarily following the rules. So when I think back on, you know, what I'm considering when I'm making the decision to be comfortable jaywalking, uh, I think about how I have an understanding of my environment. There's certain expectations that I have with respect to how cars are going to move. A car is not going to suddenly uh, disappear and regenerate, spontaneous generate somewhere else. A car moves with a certain speed uh, that I feel like I can kind of predict, that I can anticipate. A tree is not suddenly going to move. A tree is not going to jump in my way. Um, there's, general, there's a general uh, fundamental understanding that I have of my environment and the elements within my environment and I am able to predict how they're going to interact with me, and that leads me to feel comfortable making certain decisions uh, with respect to jaywalking. So now the point of that example is not to say jaywalking's okay, and it's certainly not to say it's okay to break the rules. Uh, the point of the example is to demonstrate how, uh, how people uh, leverage a certain predictability uh, surrounding the elements in our environment to be able to uh, decide how to move through space. So when we're building these autonomous mobile robots that are moving in free space amongst people beyond the structured field, it's important that we make sure that we are doing analysis, that we're layering on this additional layer of predictability to make sure that our robots move in a way um, that's comfortable and it makes it such that people will want to adopt them. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about a process for product development. And so the focus here for this presentation and the next couple of charts is going to be on the, uh, the first three buckets, like so the concept through design phase. And we will touch upon you know, test and validation as well, especially when uh, Justin starts talking about the tools. But like, let's start with the 
concept phase. And so concept of operations uh, definition. So that's my, uh, that's my customer obsession phase. And so in the concept phase, I understand my customer's needs and I figure out how I'm going to be able to meet those needs through definition of something like a conops, like a customer um, uh, concept of operations document. So then I move into a system architecting phase. And so I get certain high level requirements from my concept doc, from my concept of operations. Um, and then I start to think about what elements of my system I'm going to leverage to achieve, to meet the customer's needs. Uh, and then I can start to derive requirements um, from that as well. But then very, very critical, especially to safety critical use cases, is the design phase. And so in my design phase, there's certain analyses that I'll talk more about on the next chart and that Justin will talk more about when he talks about tools. There's certain key analyses that I need to make sure that I do to make sure that I'm understanding, that I'm characterizing the risk. When it comes to safety, risk, understanding risk, characterizing risk, and mitigating it is the name of the game. And so um, there's certain analyses that I'll do that enable me to understand the hazards, the risks aligned with my system, and to be able to make sure that I'm deriving requirements uh, that ensure that my, des my design will mitigate that risk. And so then usually at the same point in time where I'm deriving those requirements, I'm also writing a test plan to make sure that I'm going to verify and validate those requirements. But you know, after the design phase, I move forward and I implement um, a system, a product that meets those requirements. And then I integrate, you know, starting at a component level, integrate tests, verify, and then you know, going up to the system level, uh, I perform verification validation. And, um, and then finally, when I'm ready, I deploy. And so that's operational operations and maintenance phase. And so it's important to note that as I'm going through uh, this product development process, that I'm also um, defining, designing operational products. And I'm testing, I'm validating those as well. So operational products in the form of ops procedures, um, op training for people who are going to be interacting with the robot, and then maintenance procedures, maintenance training, like how often do I need to perform like certain maintenance to make sure that my product's going to meet certain safety uh, requirements. And so there's three things that I do want to mention um, before I move on from this chart, one of which is you can kind of think of this as a flattened systems engineering V. And so for those who are familiar, um, you, you can kind of see how this is the V flattened, uh, this form was easier to present to be able to have the text underneath uh, the circles. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that there's often innovation, like having done product development, having delivered many products you know, over the course of my career, um, I know that you know, oftentimes, more often than not, we need to do some sort of uh, innovation to meet the customer's needs. And so you can kind of think of it as like there's a parallel innovation engine that could be represented here, um, but it's not the focus of this talk. And it speaks to how you innovate and then insert that into your product uh, development process. And then I do also want to acknowledge <laughs> that while this is kind of an ideal situation uh, from a product development process standpoint, um, more often than not, you don't necessarily complete the phases in this order. Uh, sometimes for a variety of reasons, you might move forward with different phases and uh, like, for example, you might do some implementation or you might uh, like do some of the work before you formally define the requirements. And the point that I just want to emphasize here is that um, especially for systems, for products that have a safety critical use case, it is key that you make sure that you do the analysis, that you apply a certain amount of rigor to making sure that you understand your requirements uh, and that your system as designed, as implemented, is meeting them through test verification validation. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about some of the analysis that you do um, on the next chart. Okay, so concept through design, safety analysis. So I mentioned you start by doing your concept of operations, understanding the customer's needs, and you do a system architecture. You start to pull some system level requirements. And well, pretty much that, those documents, like that body of work, feeds into us starting to be able to do our risk assessment aligned with safety. And so there's different ways that you can do a risk assessment. Uh, a traditional one, one that we use for, at Amazon for our autonomous mobile robots is the Hazard Analysis Risk Assessment, the HARA. And so um, from the HARA, you get risk reduction measures that characterize the risk that you need to mitigate. So once I've defined my HARA, once I've done that analysis, I do something that's not represented here. I create a functional safety management plan. I might do it in parallel, which pretty much defines all of the work that I need to do to convince myself that my product is safe. Um, but then I move on and I do my functional safety concept. 
And so now we're starting to talk about functions, functions aligned with safety. And so uh, depending on the standard, like I'm defining these functions, uh, I might be defining SIFs, safety instrument of functions. And um, I align those, and so I'm going to jump down to the next line, to the safety design requirements path. Uh, I align those with some high-level design functions that I'm implementing for my system. And so I need to make sure that I'm defining these safety functions, that I'm implementing them just, you know, as Justin mentioned in like the 13.849 context, it's like you define a function pretty much as something that has an input, some sensory input perhaps, some logic surrounding that input, and then an output, uh, and so perhaps some actuation. And so like that's a common framework that we that allows us to kind of be able to define and test these functions. Um, but then I kind of take a step back and I have certain higher level design functions that represent the functions that I must implement to ensure that I'm implementing what I call the safety net. So the, the part of the system that makes sure that I'm absolutely going to be safe. And so um, examples of safety design functions for an autonomous mobile robot would be things like collision prevention or collision avoidance, direction speed control or velocity limiting. Um, and then e-stop, a fundamental emergency stop that makes sure that I'll stop when I need to. And so I'm defining these safety net functions, so these functions aligned with um, ensuring that I'm going to be safe, the functionality that I'm going to end up certifying. Um, but then I also have support functions. Like So for example, I have, in addition to my fundamental safety system, I have perhaps a mobility system that speaks to how I navigate, how I move through the world. And so my mobility system is going to try to avoid obstacles. And so, for example, it's gonna, it would try not to hit the podium. It's moving through space. It would try not to hit the podium, but it's not certified not to. And so if I just have my, safe, my, my mobility system, I might hit the podium because I'm not certifying that it, it doesn't have that extra kind of rigor of safety net. Now, when I layer in my safety net, my safety functions, those functions are defined and designed in a way and implemented in a way and then tested and verified to make sure that they absolutely, they will keep the vehicle safe um, per requirements. And so once I layer in my safety function, the mobility system will try not to hit the podium. And then if it gets too close, the safety function will kick in and make sure that I do not hit the podium. So I've defined these safety functions, these safety design functions, and so now I do some traditional systems engineering work. And there's a variety of things that I could do. Um, like what I've settled on here are, that, I, that have worked really well. Um, with respect to helping us understand the risk and inform the design uh, and derive requirements to inform the design are use cases, state machine definition, functional interface diagrams, functional description, fault tree analysis, and FAMIAs. Um, and there's a couple of other things that we might add in here and there, but those are kind of the primary uh, analyses and artifacts that we generate uh, to help us understand that functionality, to help us flush out that functionality, and then we derive requirements from that. Um, and so in addition to deriving requirements uh, for those functions, we also derive operational constraints. Because once again, I'm thinking about my safety net and making sure that my system's safe and making sure that I'm mitigating the risks that I've identified. And so sometimes there might be certain operational constraints aligned with some of the requirements, aligned with how I'm implementing these functions. And then also, I just generally always want to circle back and make sure that I'm being clear on how the safety functions are being implemented, the ones that you know, came out of my functional safety concept. So, then, like once I've got my requirements, I move on, I implement my software, I implement my hardware, and I um, define my operational procedures and do some other things as well. And I generate a test plan that'll enable me to verify that the requirements were correctly implemented. So now I'm going to take a little bit of a step to the side and just talk a little bit about perception. And so this is mobility, so this is not the fundamental safety net, not the fundamental safety system, but this is perception uh, for mobility, just to give an example, uh, to give some context to some of the things that Justin's going to talk about in a bit. So you can see that this is, uh, this is, these are images from a stereo depth camera. And so to the left, we've got one eye, and so you can kind of see flat, non-3D images, but it's hard to do perception uh, from those images, so we want to uh, use both eyes and get depth perception, which you can see, and you can see a little bit of speckles added. There's an IR emitter um, that helps give texture to the scene. And so now, like, the first step in perception is being able to perceive things. Okay, and so then, you know, another thing that we need to do is we need to be able to classify things. Like, I want to be able to tell um, the AMR, the autonomous mobile robot, from the payload uh, in case I want to decouple my payload or couple with my payload. Um, I need to be able to tell people from each other, uh, from stationary objects, from, from other objects, because I might want to be able to predict the movement of these things, and uh, I might want to behave differently as an AMR around people than I behave around other objects. So 
So Nia did a great job of talking about um, design, the design process, and how you can use this kind of standard design process to create a quality safety system, right? And, uh, you know, when we talk about safety system design, I hate to admit it, but there is a perception out there that kind of safety engineering is a little bit boring, it's not so innovative, not only in the design of the safety system, but in the process that you use to, to build out your safety system. And I kind of want to challenge that perception today a little bit by telling a story. Um, and it's, the story involves um, a little bit of in innovation that my team and I have been able to do, not necessarily in the design of the safety system, that's a whole other story that's also interesting, but um, innovation in this case we're, um, is related to the tools that we built to help us design safety systems. And I think that that's a um, unexplored territory that we're just starting to delve into today. So the story goes, um, a few years ago, I was tasked with um, kind of overseeing two autonomous mob uh, mobile robot projects. Um, both these robots were very, very similar in some ways. They were designed to pick up something, drive it around, set it down, deliver it. Um, the thing that was uh, different between the two of them was the use case and the environment, right? And as Nia explained, uh, one of the first things you do when you start a project is you create this hazard analysis risk assessment. And my job was to make sure that not only were the risk assessments for both these programs um, accurate in, in a vacuum, um, but I also needed to make sure that they were calibrated one to another so that we could compare the outputs of these risk assessments. Um, and so the long story short of this is that there was an opportunity here. I saw a challenge and there was an opportunity to innovate. Um, so let's stop and take a, a a minute to go through a risk assessment, what it is and how it works basically to kind of inform this. So a risk assessment's got kind of three phases. You've got a scope and plan. Um, you got to kind of define what the system is, what it's intended to do. After you do that, you identify what the relevant hazards are. Really the point of this is to identify the hazardous events, really, um, that could affect uh, humans interacting with a robot. And after you identify these hazardous events, you create risk mitigation measures to make sure, to ensure that um, those hazards that you've identified um, are not able to impact a person in any way, shape, or form. And uh, those risk mitigation measures, if you look on the left side of your screen, are not all created equal, right? So what functional safety really does is focus on the top, the most effective risk mitigation measures, which are, um, you know, obviously there's inherently safe design. As Nia mentioned, if a robot never moves, it's very, very safe. But in some cases, you can't design out all of those um, hazards. So the next best uh, mitigation is safety in design. Um, an electronic controlled um, separated safety system that mitigates those hazards for you. So that's what a, a hazard analysis and risk assessment or HARA does. How does that actually work in, in real life? Well, if anybody's been involved with a HARA or risk assessment work in the past, they probably recognize what they see on the screen here. It's a gigantic Excel spreadsheet. And oftentimes these spreadsheets are intimidating. Sometimes they're a little hard to read. And if you create a spreadsheet, you come back a couple of years later, oftentimes you have to reimagine what you were trying to do in the risk assessment to understand the context. It um, can get a little bit complicated. And in these two projects that I was working with, that's exactly the case. In isolation, each one of these projects applied the the direction of the standards, and they created a quality risk assessment. But when we tried to compare the risk assessment one to, a number, one to another, we discovered something. The way that they had generated hazard event, hazardous events was totally different, right? And the reason that this happened is that the classic risk assessment process is, involves getting everybody that knows about your project, all the relevant engineers in a room, put a pizza on the table, go up to the whiteboard, and start brainstorming, right? It's an additive process. You have engineers throwing ideas out there. You have other engineers challenging ideas. You have refinement of these ideas. And ultimately, these hazards that you identify get um, tuned, and you can create the hazardous events that are relevant to your robot. And these hazardous events then get characterized using the risk elements of severity, exposure, and avoidability. And that tells you what your risk mitigation measures need to be. And when you follow this kind of organic um, additive process, what I discovered is you have two different teams that have two different thought patterns in approaching the design of a robot, and the output, it's impossible to compare because the hazardous events are described in such 
different ways. And this made my team and my realize, you know what we need to do? We need to take a step back and we need to really reinvent the, the risk assessment process that we're using so that we could allow not just quality in, in isolation, but we can allow collaboration or calibration in the risk assessment so that we can unlock calibration or collaboration between the two groups. We want to have groups that can work together on different projects, co-developing um, safety systems um, that could offer possibly reuse or even um, co-development. And so um, what we did is we discovered that there are basic fundamental attributes that every risk assessment needs to have. And here are a couple examples for um, autonomous mobile robots. The robots need to have um, some understanding of what is your load condition? Are you laden or are you unladen? You have to know what your motion profile is. Are you traveling forward? Are you turning, going straight? Are you just rotating in place? You're traveling backward. Um, you've got another example is um, obstacle by type. Do you have a negative or cliff type obstacle? Do you have a collision risk with an at grade obstacle? Or do you maybe have some sort of overhead obstacle that could present a risk to your, your robot? You take all of these fundamental attributes, you define them, and if you define them in a, a systematic and repeatable way, um, and then you take those you know, systematic um, attributes and you run them through an identical process, you can now get a, a calibrated outcome. So uh, you know, if one program um, does a risk assessment, they could be looking at an overhead obstacle in the forward direction um, while laden. If you generate that standard approach on another program, they should be able to come up with that exact same hazardous event, and that's what unlocks the collaboration that we need. So this was working great. We, we, we tested this out and we were able to get risk assessments that could be compared one to one another, but we discovered another pitfall. And that was now our risk assessment process, which already was a little bit complicated and tough to you know, complete in an Excel spreadsheet. This process is now more complicated. And at this point, the Excel spreadsheets were getting gigantic, right? And we decided um, an Excel spreadsheet can no longer do what we need to do. We need to create a tool that can uh, enable this process to uh, be easy, repeatable, et cetera. So we, that's just what we did. We created an AWS hosted tool when we decided that we're not going to just stop at enabling, um, you know, risk assessments to take place in this tool. We want some other functions and features to be included in this tool to make it kind of what we would think is a kind of a best in class tool. And I'm not going to have time to go through all of the details of exactly how we implemented it, but I thought I'd share some features that I think are kind of interesting. Number one is we wanted to be able um, to have the idea of, of project um, contributors that are not necessarily functional safety engineers. You've got a lot of smart electrical engineers, hardware engineers, mechanical engineers um, that uh, really have good insight into the system. And you want them to be able to interact with a tool, but they may not have the detailed experience on how to conduct a risk assessment. So we created the concept of um, project ownership versus contributorship versus viewing members. And each one of these members have different privileges and they, um, according to their privileges, are provided with guardrails to help them execute and contribute in a way that makes sense for them. It also enables lots of these non-safety specialists to provide their specialty and their, their, per, uh, their views on things without um, providing them with maybe the stress or the um, authority to influence um, things that are outside of their specific purview. Um, another feature that was built into this tool that um, I really like is the ability to collaborate in real time live. So this is an AWS hosted tool. P anyone can log in if they've got internet access from around the world and they can collaborate back and forth live. We've, we're working this hybrid um, work environment these days where some people are working from home, some people are at the office, and maybe some people are off on another continent. And this uh, tool enables all of these people to come together at a point in time and have live discussion in it, which um, really increases the pace at which you can develop a risk assessment. There's a lot of discussion that needs to take place. And finally, we have what we've called the democratization of safety. Every one of these players, these teammates, has their unique role. Everyone has their unique perspective, and we want to make sure that everybody's opinion and thoughts are heard. And so what we enabled was a voting feature, essentially, so that everybody um, can get an equal say in what they think the characterization of risk should be. 
And so if you look on the screen, you'll see the risk elements there of ex uh, severity, exposure, avoidability. On the right side of the screen, you can see there's a gray box that says team's initial risk. And in this particular example, you can see that both severity and avoidability are given a value of 1.0. Well, what does that mean? That means that your team is voted and everybody agrees. Everybody agrees that severity and avoidability should be a one. Great, you can kind of see to the left. In fact, severity and avoidability are frozen. You have a freezing feature in there that's nice so you can limit your review cycles. Anyway, um, if you look at exposure, that's kind of the problem child here. Now we have a value of 2.3. That means that some people think that the value should be a two, some people think it should be a three, and it, this is a, a point of perhaps contention in the, in the group. To help us drive to consensus, we've got all of these obviously discussion features and whatnot, but sometimes um, opinions can get to a point where we end up with a disagree and a commit situation. So in the tool, we also built out the ability for the project owner, the functional safety engineer, to apply their uh, experience, expertise, and knowledge to this particular si uh, situation and adjudicate these uh, points of uh, disagreement. And so the, uh, the project owner can come in and say, we're between a two and a three. In my judgment, we, I'm going to say that we are a, either a two or three and provide a rationale. And all of these decisions have a rationale feature built in because every time you leave a risk assessment and come back a year later, you can't remember what you were thinking. So um, this really enables all the team members to contribute. And uh, I think it's a great example of why, how you can innovate in something that's been done forever, um, done the same way forever, but doesn't necessarily always have to be done that way forever. I've got one more example for you. So we get through this risk assessment. We know what the safety systems are gonna be looking like. We've enabled the collaboration where we can enable it. Um, we've got these mobile robots that now have all these sensors on them. And we've made assumptions about how good the sensors are, right? Um, sooner or later, you have to find out, are the sensors as good as we think they are, right? You gotta create a sensor test program. And so, um, the first thing we discovered is, hey, if we're gonna have a sensor test program, we need to have a sensor test lab. So you can kind of see on the screen, um, this is the kind of the first iteration of what we are using as a test lab. What you see in there is there's a background that can be adjusted, so for color. Um, in, the, in the middle there, you see this um, upside down truncated cone. That's actually called out um, by the standard as a human leg test object. And so we have a standardized um, object that we test. And then in the foreground, you can see there's a robotic arm there with sensors mounted on it. Um, this uh, robotic arm enables us to have repeatable testing. It also enables us to add some dynamics where appropriate um, to the test. So we set up our lab. Then we realize we don't only need to test under one condition. You know, in, in the real world, you're not gonna have these perfect conditions where the lights are just right and the floor is clean and um, everything is looking just you know absolutely brand new. And so we had to explore off nominal conditions or what we like to call factors in, in this. So um, we had to disc uh, discover what happens when somebody turns the lights down or turns the lights off or what happens if someone shines a light directly at your robot. Is it blinded? Um, beyond lighting, you know, we've got a couple examples here of thermal humidity, shock and vibe, air pollution, all of these other factors that needed to be explored. So we start figuring out all these different factors and we have to start figuring out what values for these factors should we be exploring? And very quickly we discovered, wow, that's a lot of test cases. And uh, that's a lot of test plans we're gonna have to execute. And we had to take a step back again and say, how are we gonna do all this in a coordinated way? Well, the first thing we wanted to do is say, let's figure out how to minimize the number of test cases first and see if that allows us to just get us there. Um, I won't delve into this too much, but what we ended up doing is a, a set of screening experiments using a design of experiments approach. And the long story short, we figured out out of the factors that we had listed, which factors actually had an influence on, on our detection capability and which ones didn't. We eliminated the ones that didn't. The screening experiments also allowed us to understand generally um, how the values for each one of the factors could affect the system. And we were able to streamline the set of test cases down to something much smaller than they were before. Um, at the end of the day, we still ended up where we had a lot of test cases that we had to cover and a lot of test plans. And that's when we decided we really should build a tool for this. So um, we decided at that point we need to build a test planning, 
execution and test automatic report generating tool that allows us to just keep everything straight and organized and allows us to um, execute consistency in each one of our individual tests. So when we were doing that, the first question we asked is, well, let's work our way backwards. What does this test report need to look like? What's the information that's in it? On the right side of your screen um, is an example of, a, kind of a, one of our thought experiments. You see three pictures. On the top, you see an RB, RGB image. It's really black and white. But um, on the bottom left, you see a um, disparity output. This is from a stereo camera. This is a depth map. And then on the right, you see um, that same image, but with a different filtering. Why, why am I showing this? Well, on the top image, um, it's a, a clear picture, but it gives you absolutely no depth information. When you're looking at collision avoidance systems, depth is the critical feature that you're looking for. You need to make sure that your robot's not going to run into somebody. So that image is not going to be useful in a report. Bottom left, that's better. Now you're showing disparity. You have these colors that represent different distances, but you know the way that the settings are, are put in this tool, where the tool is going out and, and analyzing depth to 30 plus meters, um, everything is a shade of purple, and it's not really providing the human reader useful information that they can um, make it insightful comments about, right? On the right, you see that same disparity output, but now truncated to a depth that makes sense for our system. And now you can actually start seeing the differential in color and in output between the leg test object and that background behind it, and even that background to the wall that's behind the background. You can see that, um, you can see now the quality of the detection. And so this is an example of us thinking through what should be included in a test report, maybe something like the bottom right picture, what isn't really valuable, like the other two pictures. So now that we kind of know what we're going to put into a report generally, what kind of data, we have to figure out how we're going to characterize that data in our tool. What you see on the screen now is um, a bunch of different attributes for that leg test object, right? So you can see that the leg test object on the screen has got a length and it's got a big diameter and it's a truncated cone that goes down to a small diameter and it's got a height and it's got a weight and it's got a color and all these other attributes, right? We program those attributes into a tool and this now the tool saves this and now we can select, you know, black leg test object or gray leg test object, insert that test object into a test case you could assemble multiple test cases that all have those attributes into test plans. Those test plans get executed, and then we can automatically report, uh, generate a report for our third-party safety assessors. And so this allows repeatability. It also allows ease of use because you can go in, replicate a test plan, create one that's slightly different. Maybe you're looking at something at one meter of distance, and you want to look at it 1.1 meter rather than one meter. You can go in, replicate a test plan, change one value, and now boom, you're done. This is a new test case that you can in integrate into a new test plan. So we've got this functionality built in the tool. Going back to the report, now we've got to auto-generate our report, right? What we did here is we um, synchronized our expectation with that of our third-party um, safety assessors. We said, here's what we think you guys want to see. We built in a collaboration tool into the um, tool that we're creating here and let them give us feedback. And once we synchronize on exactly what a report's supposed to look like, we said, all right, that's what you want, that's what you're getting. And we created a template that automatically generates. So at this point, now what we can do is we can execute test cases, upload the data, and click a button, and the tool will generate a report that you can send off to your safety assessor, saving us lots and lots of time. Um, you know, we would take what would have originally been potentially tens of years of uh, work to generate thousands of reports, and we could bring that down into a year's worth of work or less because of the automation we built into it. So kind of the takeaway here is I, w I would love for people who are building safety systems to think about whatever innovation they can um, build into not only the safety system itself, but the associated tooling and the processes. I really think that we are on the precipice of a massive amount of innovation today, and that innovation in, in tooling, in process, is going to help us with innovation in the safety system itself and really drive safety systems forward. So to conclude, we're going to talk about some key cha challenges. We're going to summarize some key challenges for autonomous mobile robots, uh, particularly you know, as we've been discussing as we start to move beyond the structured field. So first and foremost, ambiguity. 
or as I've heard uh, Justin say, I don't remember if he said it today, but ambiguity equals opportunity. Um, ambiguity surrounding the standards uh, that we certify to. And so some of these things are uh, very recent in development. Some of them are being uh, worked on as we speak, as we're working, as we're doing the design and the implementation. So making sure that you are mindful and um, apply certain rigor as you're um, deciding what standards uh, to apply, like to, 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 to use as the foundation for your safety system. And so then second, building a mobility system, building a nav and control systems that incorporates safety, but then meets availability and predictability requirements. So not incorporate safety, that has safety as a foundation and also meets availability and predictability requirements. And so back to the framework uh, that we talked about earlier uh, with respect to how to think about safety um, particularly like when you're moving beyond the structured field and making sure that you are fundamentally safe, um, but still meeting the needs of the customer and still moving in a way uh, that enables comfort for the people that you're trying to help with your product. And then finally, building that independent safety net. So like what I've been describing as uh, the safety net, that kind of foundation of safety um, in a way that makes sure that um, you ensure that the product is safe but you also minimize uh, interference with the mobility system. And so making sure that you absolutely stop when you need to stop, but you're not necessarily stopping too much, using stop as the example response here. So, you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, greatly appreciate you taking the time to listen to us talk about this stuff that we're hugely passionate about. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you.